As we've been telling you, Peter Dutton announcing he's going to go to the next election, promising to build these seven nuclear power sites. He says they should be operational by 2035 and 2037. Dr Addie Patterson, the CEO or was the CEO of the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, which operated Australia's research reactor at Lucas Heights, joins us now. Hi there, Doctor. Hi, uh, good morning. Great to chat to you. What was your first reaction to this policy that the opposition leaders just outlined? Well, I've, I've literally just got it in front of me and I've seen the uh, press releases and it's just literally still warm because it's come off my uh, my printer just down the, the, the corridor. Um, obviously, there's been some uh, stuff that's come out around what its objectives are and so on. My first reaction is, uh, and has always been my position, uh, why are we, as a modern democracy, banning things at the federal and in a number of the states of our nation uh, when low carbon uh, nuclear electricity provides the cheapest to consumer costs uh, and would transform our electricity grid, which is getting longer, more dilute and less reliable and is getting very, very expensive. It's interesting, though, that the CSIRO GenCost study said that nuclear power would be three times as expensive as solar and wind. Do you disagree with uh, that? Well, that's not what the GenCost report says. Remember, GenCost means the cost of generation. And uh, <clears throat> the CSIRO has got no expertise in the cost of generation. And uh, they, what they do is they take publicly available f uh, figures of the construction costs of nuclear power plants, usually in countries that have got regulatory environments that are kind of designed to stop nuclear. They take those costs um, and then they convert them into a generation cost using an algorithm which is provided to them by a private sector firm that is not an expert in nuclear industry. It's a gen cost report. I call it the gen con report. There's no reliability. I've engaged the CSIR for a number of years uh, both um, directly and also through the press to say we can work together to sort this out, but they've got no inclination to do it. That's and so certainly interesting. It, it's absolutely fundamentally true. Um, and, and because gen cost is then seized by people in the, in the media as an authoritative thing about what it means for consumers, let me give you one example. The Finnish plant that was switched on about a year ago was over budget and it uh, also took too long to build. When they switched it on, the cost of electricity for Finnish people went down to one third of what it is today. My message to the public of Australia, you are being conned because the cost of electricity is based on reliable, always on supply. Wind is only available on average two days out of five, 40% capacity factor. Nuclear power plants globally um, generate more than 93% uh, capacity factor. Reliable, always on low carbon electricity is the best ecological objective. We would stop ripping through the hills of Queensland with horrible new wind turbines. It's just, it's absolutely an, an abuse of env our environmental heritage to put wind turbines for 150 kilometres along the ridges in Queensland. So are you saying the there were... that it might be more expensive initially to actually build them, but once they're up and going, the overall costs will be, will be cheaper? I'm not saying that. That's what the International Energy Agency says. Gotcha. Um, these, these are publicly available figures. And, and the debate has been, it's been wedged um, by a failure of the, the parties. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm non-partisan. I've never been a member of a, a political party ever. I've, I decided that I have to be, uh, you know, free oxygen in the air that the people of Australia breathe, not the heady houses in Canberra. And it's fundamentally important for the people of Australia to know that it is a, an absolute con to suggest that if we had nuclear electricity, that it would be more expensive. I was shocked and appalled by the recent um, advertising from the, the current um, <clears throat> Uh, the current Labor Party, of cooling towers, which people think are nuclear, but they're just cooling towers used um, with all forms of nuclear energy that is thermally based, uh, superimposed with a trefoil above the Sydney Opera House. You know, this type of scare campaign, this dystopian 
ancient uh, fear-based campaign does not belong in a rational, modern, liberal democracy. I guess other Bans people... Bans should be lifted. I, I, right. So there's, there's the next question I have for you. At the moment, we have a ban on nuclear industry in this country, on nuclear power. That came in, I believe, in the John Howard era. How easy would it actually be to overturn that? Is that something that could happen if the coalition isn't supported by the other members of Parliament? Well, look, up uh, two things. Uh, that ban, the federal ban, uh, was six or seven senators sitting in a room uh, after midnight, slipping something into a bill uh, that had to go through for other reasons, and that was the basis of the ban. There are also bans in uh, in in Queensland. There's bans in New South Wales and so on. So this is not just a federal issue. My call is to every senior politician in Australia to read what what I'm reading, just as I speak to you, mm. um, the coalition's policy. Uh, the first thing is it looks really complicated. Let's just lift the bands. That's step one, to, to get everybody, every person of goodwill on every side of politics, including the Greens who support nuclear, and I, I applaud all of those that I've met and talked to in small rooms, and let's get the bands lifted. Because if we lift the bands, a lot of other things become possible. The discourse becomes less dystopian. Uh, the fear is taken out of it, and it becomes an economic and rational choice. The other thing that people don't know, to build all of the solar panels and wind turbines, we are going to have to double the size of the grid. The, your electricity bill, my electricity bill, 40% of that bill is the grid. What happens when we've doubled the size of the grid? People are worrying about the cost of, you know, the capital cost of a nuclear power plant. Nobody's talking about the capital cost of doubling the size of the eastern grid. The eastern grid in Australia is the most complex machine in the southern hemisphere. The policy of this government is to make it twice as big as it is and twice as complex, frankly, if you have to integrate intermittent sources into it. So, Every time the sun goes down, solar panels go to sleep. You know, emergency services, sewage pumping, um, landing aircraft, all of these things happen at night. Smelting aluminium happens at night. How do people believe that we can create a grid that's double the size, lower energy density, and have the, the quality of life we currently have? This policy is based on a failure to get proper engineers in the room. I mean, engineers are being banned from giving talks as we speak. I, I, just as we, another element I do want to talk to you about yeah. on this, and this is the timing, how quickly we could do this. Obviously, we have targets yeah. that we've signed up to in the Paris Agreement, um, yeah. and particularly, you know, net zero by 2050. Is it yeah. really possible to get these uh, these built, uh, the, the coalition's hoping by 2035? Is, is that yeah. possible, considering if we look overseas, in Europe and yeah. North America. You know, they are years behind schedule and they're over budget, I should say. Uh, uh, do you think well, we can do it on yeah, time? Yeah, uh, you're not an expert and you're over-summarising. Okay, okay, fair enough, yeah. Uh, uh, a really good example is the Emirates, okay? Well, I did they, say Europe it, and North America because I know the yeah, Emirates. UAE is I'm different. sorry, yeah, yeah. but you, uh, uh, UAE is not different. U, UAE negotiated with all of its partners internationally to establish what is called the gold standard. This is, is, this is often obscured in these debates because they wanted to be able to build Korean plants with an independent group of international regulators overseeing their new regulator so that they would do it to the highest international standards. Their first plant, I think, took seven and a half uh, years. Uh, if you take it from first concrete uh, to first electrons on the grid, uh, the last one, I think, took five and a half years. What we're talking about here is wanting to do something and setting up the regulatory framework. Our PANSA is a fantastic regulator. And, and our PANSA, with extra capacity, working with the gold standard set for UAE, um, you know, the Korean plants already have a supply chain. We don't have to develop a supply chain. If we, we take the AP1000, um, the ones in Georgia took a long time to build. But as I say, when they switch them on, the cost of electricity goes down. And the public of Australia needs to understand that with nuclear in our grid, the grid will be half the size. All of those easements, all of those poles and wires going past your house and out across the hills and fields, 185 kilometres of wind turbines over pristine forests in Queensland will not be necessary. 
and we can do it in 10 to 12 years if there is shared intent by shared political uh, actors acting in the best interests of Australians. It is time to change it. Nuclear for Australia, led by Will Shackle, I'm his chair. Uh, we're going up to Anstow today to talk more about this. Young people, Will Shackle's leading this charge, have transformed the debate. A vast majority of people under 25 support nuclear power or think that it's not a problem in their lives. Around I guess, 70%. I guess if, I, if I summarise a little bit of what you were saying there is you do think it's possible. Um, and Absolutely. Yeah, we're getting Absolutely. Okay, we are going to have not, to... Yeah. It's definitely not too expensive. So that is the old mantra that was used to get the bans in place based on fear and irrational hatred of nuclear. We've got to grow Dr. up. Dr Patterson, you know, I'm afraid is... we, have, we do have to wrap up there, but I am taking all your points on board. You say it's not too expensive and that we can do it on time and that perhaps, uh, you, un, in your opinion, some of the science that we're being told, be it through I, the I, media or my, through the CSIRO, it's uh, not is my perhaps It's my opinion. Right. It's global, global expertise of people who know about nuclear power and electricity, and I am one of them. You certainly are one of those, and I appreciate your time right. today very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr okay. Addy Patterson Cheers. there, the CEO of the Australian Nuclear, was the CEO of the Australian Nuclear Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, which was operating Australia's research reactor at Lucas Heights.